So Jackie Houghton is going to talk to us about um, the modules that they developed at the University of Leeds for virtual field trips. And I think this might be of a lot of interest to a lot of people. Mark Helper has um, used these and he will chime in at the end about how he's used them. All right, Jackie, it's to you. Oh, okay, I can't hear you, Jackie. I think you're muted again. You're still muted. Yep, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, indeed. Oh, if, okay. if people can't hear her or want to put questions in the chat, Anne and I will be looking at those to make sure that um, we, we can communicate to her if, any problems. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? It should say virtual landscapes and be a pretty picture of a lighthouse. Yes, we can. Brilliant. Okay, so um, what uh, me and some colleagues have been working on for I think about the last six years or so is this project called Virtual Landscapes. Um, we are a group of geologists, I just kind of make this clear, we're a group of geologists, we're not gamers, we're not software people, we're not programmers. Um, we were by chance introduced to gaming software and we suddenly realized what we could do with it um, with regards to sort of geology and mapping skills and we've been trying to get it to work ever since. Um, what I'm going to do with this presentation is I'm just going through this PowerPoint, um, just give you a little bit of idea of the project and then hopefully I'm going to bring up each of our worlds uh, in turn um, so you can actually have a look at them. Um, what we've done with the project is uh, create this series of screen-based virtual reality environments. So very much screen-based, they're not something that you use um, with the goggles or anything like that. Um, we've been using the Unity 3D game engine software because that's what we were introduced to right at the beginning of the project. Um, and the worlds that we've created, the idea is that we're trying to enhance um, the skills, the map skills that students have uh, prior to going into the field. So normally I'm saying with these worlds, oh, they're not a replacement for field work. Um, you know, they're just uh, a tool for training. However, of course, we're living in a slightly odd world at the minute and they may very much need to be an alternative to field work over this summer. Um, the other thing that we look at is uh, developing 3D visualization skills and we've use these as sort of accessible parallel provision for field trips, um, both for our own students at Leeds, but also as part, part of an accessible uh, field trip um, that we ran about a year and a half ago. Everything we do is on the internet, freely available for anyone to use. So this is the front of our website. Um, we've got sort of five worlds up here at the minute. Um, from top left, we've got Lighthouse Bay, 3D geological maps, topographic maps, Ross Collin, which is a real place, and one called Three Rivers Hills. Um, I'm going to start looking at the topographic map world because this is kind of the simplest um, that people may be interested in if they are, um, you know, sort of quite uh, introductory level um, geology and working with maps. Um, so the idea with this uh, is. Um, we give students a you know normal field slip if you like a normal 2d map and then they can use the virtual landscape to explore that in 3d um, the sort of questions that we ask our students um, just on the paper map if you like are to get them to think about what they're looking at so highest and lowest points on the map um, how far above sea level you are you at a particular point can you identify steep or shallow slopes um, draw a topographic profile, describe what you might see as you walk along it, and then I'm hoping this is going to work. Yes, there we go. Okay, the one, can you now see a world that's kind of floating a bit? Yes, we can. Is that Great, yeah. Um, so this is the actual 3D landscape. Um, one of the things I've realised coming back to this is it's very sensitive to the mouse movement, so I'm not going to move it too much because it uh, can make people feel a bit seasick if it keeps uh, swinging around. But so, yeah, this is a 3D world. You can move out from it. Um, you can go in closer. You can you get the right button. There we are. Now we're actually on the surface of the map itself. Um, you can walk around. 
quite slowly through here, but it's the idea is, you know, you can ask students things like, well, you know, what happens when you walk along the contour? You know, you should, with any luck, roughly be walking around at the same height. You can get them to go up to the highest point um, and have they identified it correctly from looking at their paper map. There is also, you can swap to a, oh, I've come down behind a fence. Hang on a second. I'll just go past that fence, there we go. You can come out into a terrain version of it so they can just sort of make that comparison. They can see where the walls are, where the rivers are, um, where the you know little bridge is. Um, and they can walk around, freely walk around the world. Um, so that's our sort of simplest topographic uh, world. Um, the, there we are. The next ones uh, that we have are where well, we've done the same sort of thing. Um, but with geological uh, maps. There's two versions of these. One where we keep the same strike but vary the dip, and one where we keep the same dip and vary the strike. Um, and one of the things we've done with these maps in class is to try and get students to see if they can work out their own uh, sort of rules, if you like, seeing if they can come up with sort of being in the valleys uh, idea from using these worlds. Um, you know, to think about as you change the dip, what's that doing for the apparent thickness of a unit on a map? Um, to get them to think about, you know, that relationship between contours and beds. Uh, I'll just, which one's coming up first? Okay, so this is, which one have I got? Oh, right, okay. Th this is the uh, change in dip. Sorry, it's got the same name on my computer as with the, the change in strikes one. So again, this is the, um, horizontal bedding, you can rotate the image round. I always encourage students to have a look at it from the side like this, looking at a hillside because you've got a kind of proxy, I'd say, for a cross section. Um, again, we can come in closer, we can, oh, you can walk around on the surface of the map should you wish to. Look out again. And with the dips, you can just hit the keys uh, one to six. So go from horizontal that's about 11 degrees, 22, and you can see how the um, pattern, the, the map uh, pattern is changing as you change the dips of the beds. So again, it's sort of encouraging to think about being in the valleys and such like. Um, we do have all the um, 2D maps available of these, but I realise they're not on the internet, I don't think at the minute, but we'll get hold of those if people are interested. Uh, this is the where we change the strikes. So you can watch how the outcrop pattern changes as you rotate the strike around. It's rotating 45 degrees each time as we go around. Um, the, and the same again. It looks sunnier and you can see the sky like that. I don't know why it's such a dark grey background. We've never been able to change it. As I say, we're not not software people. Um, so anyway, the again, it's about sort of encouraging students to notice how the different different dip and different strikes of the beds uh, show different outcrop patterns. Um, okay, so that's the sort of three D models. There we go. So the next three worlds that we've got, the other three worlds we've got, are all uh, around mapping and field skills. Jackie, there's um, some um, questions that I can't answer in the meantime about Mac versus PC and what platform it works on best. Do you want to address that? Uh, yes, that's fine. Um, the, all of the worlds except one called the Three River Hills and Ross Collin can be run online by any, uh, by the Mac or PC. None of these are mobile. The, these are all computer-based only. Um, the, so the topographic maps, geological maps, Lighthouse Bay can just be run online by anybody. Um, all of them can be downloaded and run on PCs. Um, we've discovered that Three River Hills, which I didn't think you could run on a Mac, uh, there are ways of making it run on a Mac that Mark has found and told me just this morning, so he may say a little bit more about that. We are also developing a version of Ross Collin that will be downloadable onto a Mac as well. So, um, yeah, they're more or less across both platforms, but Macs are more tricky with the ones that you have to download. 
does that answer the question? I can't see. Uh, yeah, that, that answers it fine. I think um, you can go right ahead. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So the all three of the mapping worlds are kind of the same, you know, aim is the same design. Um, the the main shot that you can see at the back on screen at the minute is from Three River Hills. Um, in the foreground, you have an outcrop. It's rather clumsy looking. We've got better as we've gone along. You click on these and a notebook uh, comes up and gives you information. Um, they were designed as an in-class exercise um, where students would have a field, uh, a paper field slip and notebook to record information in with the idea that they were then sent forth into the virtual world to um, map the rocks there. So from all three of the worlds, you can uh, get students to produce a geological map, to be able to draw a cross section, create a strap column, um, and a field report with a little sort of geological history in it. Um, the simplest world is Lighthouse Bay. Um, it's very simple geology, all the beds uh, dip north, 22 degrees. Uh, in class, if you're going to map the whole lot, students do it within two to four hours-ish, depending on their experience. Um, they usually need longer to draw up um, sort of cross-section strap columns, but the main mapping is probably doable in that time. Um, I'll just bring the world up. Uh, where is it? Okay, the, I'm going to have mouse issues. Right, sorry, it's jumping around a bit. Um, okay, so this is Lighthouse Bay. As you can see, it's the same as we look up the value there. It's actually the same topography that's been used for the um, topographic maps and the geological um, maps. So yeah, it's the same topography we've just reused. Um, so the idea is that the students come into this world, um, you can walk around, you can only cross the rivers at the bridges as you would in the real world. Oh, sorry, excuse me. I'm trying to keep this as smooth as possible because I realise it's probably jumping for people. Um, there you go. You can click on the red outcrops there. It looks a bit better now. You get the information. Um, make a note of that and carry on. As we got the river, we'll cross into a different rock type. Um, you can tell we're now going up to a grey outcrop. And again, you get more information there. One of the things is this world is that the vegetation maps the geology um, underneath and um, you could actually map it from the vegetation alone because that's how it was designed. So if you want a sorter exercise or easier exercises, it's things like, can you look at the vegetation and identify a pattern? How does this reflect the geology? And then go and find a different outcrop on each of the, or outcrop on each type of vegetation and see if this works. Um, also, you can choose one boundary and just walk that. Um, the world, the geology was created using stripe lines, stretch contours. Um, so the whole lot you can map um, using uh, structure contours. Three River Hills uh, was our first world that we made and we learned a lot doing it. Um, we made quite a few mistakes that we, not, you know, we weren't really able to go back and correct including a problem with the topography, which was far, far steeper than we realised. Um, and in reducing it, we ended up reducing the dips, which has resulted in a slightly strange looking overtoned and sheared out syncline. Um, it's a much bigger world. If you did want to map the whole lot of it, it's sort of one to three days, probably depending on experience. It's not really something we get our students to do um, unless they don't go on, on one of our two week mapping field trips. Um, what we tend to get them to do is map um, along the sort of northern map of transect along the sort of northern river up here. That works quite well as a sort of two to three hour exercise, getting through a cross section through that. Um, another simpler exercise is to map around the west coast, just the far side of that normal fault, because um, the geology is, is much simpler there. Or if you want a bigger mapping exercise, uh, um, mapping sort of about the top half, top third of the map works quite well. Um, oh, wrong map, sorry, I'm just trying to find it. There it is, there we are. Right, this is through River Hills. Um, as you can see, it's a really large area. The outcrops here are really nice and obvious. They're the big grey lumps. Um, as I say, this was the first world we made, so the um, vegetation 
uh, is quite basic. It doesn't match the ge underlying geology. Um, we were learning as we went along, um, but this is still quite a good fun world to have a look around. Um, one of the other things I forgot to say is that there are GPSs in all the mapping worlds. Um, so students can use those to get the hang of you know, grid references, marking out crops on the field slip using the grid references. Um, right. There are also compasses. Which is, oh, sorry, excuse me, you can't see it very well on here, but there's a compass that you can see more and more clearly. Um, I don't know if anyone can hear the sounds, but we have sound effects in the worlds, um, including a fighter jet flying over, because this is quite a common experience that we have, at least in the UK, uh, with the RAF practicing in these remote areas where we tend to do geology. Um, coming back to there. Um, yes, I mean, some of the skills that we practice with these mapping worlds are things like just getting students to uh, practice what size of um, outcrop to draw, what size of symbol, you know, what symbols do you need for bedding, what symbols do you need for cleavage, how to mark on a fault, um, you know, what sort of thickness of pen is going to work. It, it can be just very, those very basic skills right the way up to um, mapping the whole of the area. Our third uh, world is uh, Birchall Ross Collin, which is based on um, an area in the UK. It's in, off the coast of Wales. There's a little map down here showing you where it is. Um, it's the first world that we created that was based on a real place. Um, the, it was created as part of an inclusive accessible field trip that we ran about a year and a half ago. And it was particularly designed to give a sense of the area uh, for students who might not be able to actually visit it. Um, so it includes things like photos and high-res 3D images of some of the outcrops. Uh, let me just find it. I found myself. So there we go, we're having mouse problems. So this is looking down on an area called the gully. Um, this is using uh, a 3D photogrammetry in there. So this is, uh, say, copy the real place. And again, I see we've got notebooks lying around. Oh, we've got a camera. There we go. Uh, so you click on the camera and it gives you a photograph of, of the real place that's looking down into the gully. Um, oh, there we go. So we're, we're still developing, this world works as a mapping world, uh, but we're developing more of these 3D images um, to put into this world. But bear with me just a second. I'm sorry, it's really jumpy. If you look up that way, even on this sort of scale, and then you can make out the folds in the, the quartz veins. It, it's a beautiful area with very detailed geology. Um, I'll come off that. Um, so for using it, it's actually quite a large scale. It's quite a simple asymmetric structure. Um, as you can tell just from looking around there, there are some real complicated uh, details in there uh, with small scale folding cleavages and such like. The photos uh, I've got up on screen down here is us using it on the um, accessible field trip that we did. You can see we've got the field slip down here. Uh, there's aerial images uh, from um, Google Earth. I think that's from, and I've got it up on the screen and they're working as a pair here to complete the map. The map on the uh, far right hand side is one of the students' maps um, that they were working along there. And the centre map is one of my colleagues' maps um, from the area. So you can see overall it's fairly straightforward structure, but there's quite a lot of detail that you can go into if you wish to with that world. Um, using these worlds in the classrooms, what we've tended to find over time is that students make the same mistakes um, that they do when they're, when they're in the field, which is great because it kind of, you know, um, shows that these work, work, worlds work well. Um, so just as a point where you're, you're getting your students to use them, um, we've found students tend to wander around the landscape with no clear plans, um, or they outcrop capture, as I call it, which is when they run around as fast as they can, getting all the outcrops on the map, and don't and worry about the interpretation afterwards, um, which also leads to problems. Um, students tend to focus on map creation, um, so they focus on collecting the data readings, um, and they don't notice that there's actually a lot of additional data in the notebooks, particularly in the sketches, which, which will help them actually with 
um, the map and cross section and so on. Um, I've just put some useful info up there um, uh, to contact me. We've got, we're, we're up on uh, Teach the Earths at Carlton. Um, if you're interested in accessible field trip and some couple of publications from it, it's there. And we did, we have one publication on using these worlds from five years ago now. Um, that info's there. Uh, so that, I think I've talked through all my expected to already. Um, so I've got, we've got time for questions. Um, and this is a uh, photograph from Anglesey because it's a very beautiful place. So Jackie, so there's a couple, you. yes, there's a couple questions that I can't answer. How long did it take you to develop one of those worlds? Uh, the simplest worlds like um, the geological maps are probably, um, you know, sort of measured in weeks. Lighthouse Bay, maybe quite a few weeks. The Ross Collin um, is measured in months. Um, it's a real, shall I stop sharing my screen? Uh, no, um, sure, why not? Um, yes, no. That's great. Um, there's another question. Does it have, capa what capacities does the website have? So what if several courses were using it at the same time? Um, we've not had a problem with it yet. We've not had a problem with it in the past when we've had a lot of our students on it. Um, where people can, we generally recommend just downloading and running off your own computer. Um, so it's the university server. So hopefully um, it could stand quite a, quite a a few people working on it at once but if you can I'd always recommend just downloading it because then you don't need to worry about sort of internet connection. Okay and then you mentioned a stratigraphic column is that specific to one world? No all the um, all, all of the world should be able to draw strat columns from the geological models um, you know you can work out very simply um, just on you know some basis of color. Uh, the mapping worlds are all consistent geologically um, so you can work out the oldest, the youngest rocks, the thickness of the rocks um, from the map and um, from your cross section and use that to um, create like a strat column. Okay, I'm going to let the questions keep coming in for a moment. Mark, you've used this in one of your classes. I don't know which one or how much you've done that. Do you want to just say something from a user's perspective on it? Sure. Um, I have um, a couple of weeks ago spent a weekend with uh, a, a single day with half my class on a Saturday and half my class on a Sunday, about 54 students. We, we ran the Lighthouse Bay exercise and I wrote up kind of a workflow for the students to use. I wasn't certain it was going to work all that well, so I kind of wrote a standalone <clears throat> description and, uh, of, of what I wanted them to do and then the deliverables and it worked quite well. I have up on screen here um, my single day outline. Uh, we started at 10 in the morning and ran to about 3.30 in the afternoon the first day uh, with the students and had virtually no tech issues. Um, had one student that had some difficulty, but uh, we were using both Macs and PCs, didn't have any, any problems. Um, <clears throat> they seemed to like it really well. We uh, kind of did it in, in a, these 45 minute to hour long sessions. They, took off with either a small group in a breakout room or by themselves and we reassembled about every hour or hour and a half and uh, to answer questions and to ask questions and thought questions to think about. I put together um, this write-ups on the CERC site um, for anybody that wants to use my uh, workflow here and uh, I was quite impressed. I, I, uh, I'm going to do another one. I'll, this was Lighthouse Bay. I'll, I'm, I've got a trip this weekend, so-called trip, <laughs> virtual trip anyway and I'll use the Three River Hills exercise so uh, it's a little uh, there's maybe a few more technical issues there but it, it seems to be uh, something students like to do and I think it's extremely valuable as a, a way to introduce them to um, the kinds of things we do when we were out in the field so how do you plan a traverse where are you going to go next uh, what kind of working hypothesis can you develop from a few limited exposures how do you finish a map from a few outcrop observations uh, simple mundane things like how to plot strikes and dips and um, <clears throat> draw contacts. Um, so uh, this next exercise is a lot more challenging as Jackie noted and it's going to be interesting to see how they can adapt to something that's more than just a, a you know a panel of uniformly dipping rocks but uh, I was I, I think it's a terrific way to start. Um, I have a class where we do 
three weekend field trips. They're all mapping related. <clears throat> of course, we can't do that now. And I saw, as Jackie mentioned, basically the same kind of issues that we see in the field um, in making these virtual world maps. So yeah, I'll stop there. Great. Um, so let's see a couple of other comments that came in or what were the learning curve or the computer needs to building the models? Um, the learning curve to use Unity is very, very steep. If you're not, you know, if, you're, if you've not used it before, it is, um, yeah, it, it requires a long run in. Um, it's not um, easy or obvious to do. There's plenty online that you can sort of get guidance on. Um, I would say if people want to make their own, um, it will take a long time if you're not used to it. Um, it depends how complicated you want the world to be. Um, the, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably, you can download a personal copy of Uni. If you want to put anything up on websites for other people to use, you have to buy a license for it. Um, the Unreal, I know you can use for free, um, which is a very similar sort of game engine. Um, another question, do you incorporate health or safety considerations such as avoiding the dead sheep? Um, the, we sometimes use the dead sheep as an Easter egg to go find. Um, we do have things like you can only cross the rivers uh, at bridges. Um, we have developed uh, for one of these, we did do a sort of risk assessment and discuss that, you know, about not going down steep slopes and such like. So there is a we do talk about an element uh, of the health and safety in there. Great. Um, yeah, I agree. It's very interesting that students make the same um, it, it judgment errors in the virtual world as in the real world. And so this could be a potentially very useful um, even for that. Yeah. Okay. I don't see any questions. Does anybody have any last minute questions? You can un unmute and ask if you have those or write in the chat for Jackie. Can I just ask one question of people? Um, we have got a Unity license again because we didn't for quite a while. So there is a potential for maybe putting a different version of Lighthouse Bay, so with perhaps more complex geology. Um, if that is something people would find useful um, to develop a slightly more complex um, mapping world that's not as big as, as Three River Hills, um, and probably easier to use. Um, the other thing is I could make available things like the, um, the Lighthouse Bay. Obviously, I, I created a lot of, I used Illustrator um, and have all the files with all the different um, stretch contours on and I could make those available to people if they would be useful um, if they wanted to create their own sort of exercises around, I don't know, three point problems or such like. So it's really if there's anything that people think that would be useful that we might be able to produce in the next few weeks um, to, to let me know and we'll see what we can do. That sounds great. And I have a question for you. Can we put something behind a instructor firewall on the CERC web pages? I believe we can do that. Yeah, I know Jackie's been in correspondence with um, the CERC staff and, and they're working to get those set up. Any for And this is useful for anyone to know too, as you upload materials, if you have answer keys or things that you um, don't want to be as widely available, there's a feature called a teacher stash on the um, CERC website and you just have to let the, you can put that in a submission note when you um, submit your activity and the staff will, will add that um, feature for those files. And what it means is that people have to be, um, have to have a, a CERC account and be kind of shown to be a teacher. There is an actual person who, who checks, it's not a rigorous check and it can happen quite fast, but it just means that there won't be lots of students hopefully getting your, your answer keys. Great, I think we're gonna transition to Rick at this point. Rick, if you wanted to start sharing your screen, that'd be great. I did wanna thank Jackie for both the presentation and for developing these modules, they're great. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Jackie. All right. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Rick. Great, and you should see a uh, uh, gray screen with uh, GMDE on it, so. Uh, 
I hope everybody is doing well, Jackie. That was really cool. Um, makes me want to be a student again. So uh, thanks to, for all your hard work. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a program that I developed several years ago in the course of looking at stratigraphics, thickness uncertainties, and areas and balance cross sections. But it's expanded to be kind of a full featured uh, uh, program to extract information data from a geologic map. It's a desktop program that runs on Mac, uh, Windows, and Linux platforms. There's also a companion iOS version that runs on uh, iPads and so on for use in the field, although that uh, is probably less relevant in this day and age than uh, uh, the desktop programs. Uh, the place where you can download the program is in the, the link at the bottom, and at the end of these uh, introductory slides, I'll uh, show that link again. So <clears throat> as a mapping program, you need base maps. And uh, there are two different types of base maps you can use with GMDE. Uh, you can use basic raster images in the uh, flavors that you see there listed there. Uh, and um, they are um, such as you might download from the USGS or the Canadian Geological Survey. Uh, those base maps do need to be uh, uh, geo-referenced uh, with four latitude longitude pairs and we do a uh, least squares best fit to a UTM projection since we do our uh, calculations and Cartesian uh, coordinates and the program will let you know whether the fit is good enough or not and for most uh, Canadian and US maps certainly uh, in my experience it is. Uh, the other map type that can be used in the program are MB tiles. Uh, MB tiles were originally developed for uh, mobile devices uh, because mobile devices don't have much RAM uh, memory, but they're also very useful, especially when you're using large satellite images as base maps. And one of the satellite images that I'll show you later in the demo uh, is um, 800 megabytes in size, so it's a, a pretty hefty uh, thing and yet works pretty well in the program. Uh, MB tiles, as you may know, use a, a pseudo mercator or a spherical mercator projection. Uh, this was a kludge uh, uh, by uh, people at Google and elsewhere uh, to make their mapping programs run faster by assuming that the Earth is spherical rather than ellipsoidal. Uh, at the scales that we're interested in, uh, the errors are uh, certainly small enough from that assumption that it doesn't really affect things. Uh, there are a number of um, commercial programs that can, excuse me, uh, produce MB tiles, Global Mapper, for example, GDAL, a freeware uh, um, uh, version, MapTiler, et cetera, can all produce uh, MB tiles files. I use the uh, MapTiler. Uh, you can get a version of MapTiler, uh, which can uh, deal with rasters up to 10K by 10K. Uh, pixels for uh, uh, about $30 or so. So it's not too expensive, although they do have uh, more expensive tiers, pricing tiers as well. Um, if we're going to do calculations, we need not only X and Y, but we also need Z. So you have to have topography. And um, uh, GMDE provides two different ways of getting topography, actually three. The most primitive way would be what we're all used to, reading the contours on a, a topographic base map, but uh, we automate that process a little bit. The easiest way is, is to use an internet elevation server. When you click on the map, the uh, app goes out to your specified internet elevation server, sends it a latitude-longitude pair, the server sends back an elevation for that point and displace it for you, and all of that happens in under a second. Um, there are four different elevation servers uh, uh, that one can use in the program. Uh, government servers from the USGS and from Canada uh, are free. Uh, they're somewhat slow, and of course, they're limited to the uh, US and to Canada. There are also two commercial servers implemented, MapQuest and GeoNames, which are global and uh, use the uh, SRTM uh, topographic database. Um, those are actually limited uh, uh, in my program uh, to 10 to 15,000 queries per month. That's across all users of GMDE worldwide. Uh, and so they can get overloaded and, and uh, when they stop returning elevations, it means that they've been overloaded for the month. So I'd encourage people to use the free servers uh, uh, if they can. 
Um, more flexible, although requires a little more work on your part, is to um, uh, use locally stored digital elevation models. A GMDE can read only one format, uh, but a popular one, the grid float format, uh, that's one of the options if you download a DEM from the USGS website, for example. There are three files in a grid float uh, uh, DEM. The large binary file has the suffix FLT, and there are two small metadata files, uh, .hdr and .prj. And you need all three files uh, in order to uh, use the uh, local DEMs. And uh, local DEMs are required for one thing, and that is uh, contact uh, projection across topography. Um, the, uh, today I'll be showing you all uh, stuff from local uh, uh, DEMs just for uh, speed and, and not taxing my, uh, my home uh, internet connection too much. All right. Um, in terms of functions, here's a partial list of the functions that uh, GMDE can perform. It, you can digitize contacts uh, and digitize orientation symbols. Um, you can do three plus point problems. That means you can use more than three points and, and get a statistical best fit of a plane to the uh, multiple points. Uh, you can do map thickness calculations. Um, for all of the calculations done with position vectors, uh, GMDE allows you to enter your estimate of the uncertainty on the position vectors, and those uh, uncertainties are propagated through to the three-point problem and the map thickness problem, so you uh, get uh, the uncertainty on the calculated values as well, and those can be eye-opening. Uh, GMDE can also output 3D symbols uh, and contacts to uh, Google Earth, thanks to some code that uh, Tom Blankensop developed uh, uh, several years ago. Um, we can draw topographic profiles with contacts and uh, parent dips uh, on them, uh, and actually also uh, project, uh, use a cylindrical fold model to project contacts onto vertical uh, cross sections. Uh, but we can also do down plunge. Uh, sections. It does piercing point calculations. That's one of the things I'll demo here in a minute. Uh, calculate depth to folded surfaces and project contacts based on orientation. From a pedagogical point of view, I think it's important for students to realize that mapping is actually a quantitative activity. It involves lots and lots of numbers. They don't usually think about it in that way, uh, but uh, GMDE exposes all of the position vectors and the calculated values to the user, whether student or professional. And people who are really interested can take those position vectors and actually have the students do the calculations for themselves so they learn how the, uh, um, the computer is doing it. Uh, some of you may know I have a, a free lab manual on my webpage and uh, several of the exercises, the students actually capture position vectors from GMDE and then do their calculations in a spreadsheet program, or if they knew a programming language, they can do that. Um, here's a picture of uh, the um, output to uh, Google Earth um, from the area of uh, the uh, Canadian Rockies, which I'll be demoing here in just a minute, um, uh, showing you uh, how the uh, mapped uh, geologic contacts and orientations from those mapped geologic contacts actually look on uh, the uh, Google Earth imagery from uh, this part of uh, southern Canada. So for future reference, the program itself again uh, can be downloaded from the first um, uh, URL the uh, free structure lab manual from the second URL. Mm -hmm. And all of the maps and DEMs that I'm showing today, I put into a Dropbox um, address, which you can see down below. And I uh, assume that, that we can put these links or maybe even the files themselves onto the uh, CERC webpage, but uh, we can worry about that later. All right, so let me uh, demo the program for you. Um, bring it up here. Uh, here uh, is the program. Uh, what you're looking at is the uh, geologic map of the Siffleur River East Quadrangle, one of the suite of maps that uh, Ray Price and uh, Eric Mountjoy mapped in the Canadian Rockies uh, back in the 60s, uh, a classic uh, area by far. 
Uh, you can see a large map area on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, uh, you see uh, the data area where the uh, data values appear. Uh, there are three position vectors here. If we want a stratigraphic thickness, we have a fourth one. I'm actually going to put in here the, um, uh, some uncertainties. Let's say we have about 50 feet. Uh, this map is set to feet. You can choose either feet or meters for horizontal and 50 meters in vertical uh, positional uncertainty. That's probably being generous. Uh, and now let's do a three-point problem. I'm going to show you the slow way to do the three-point problem first, which is to each, use each one of these click buttons next to the row of um, coordinates for position vector, and then you click on the map, and it sets the first one. Uh, it's automatically put in the elevation for you. You don't have to type it in. We'll do the second one now, and we'll do the third one. If I'm talking faster than the screen by a lot, uh, somebody should time in, chime in and tell me to slow down. It's the radio actually working pretty well, Rick. Oh, okay, thank you, Basil. Um, the radio buttons here determine which of the three position vectors the strike and dip is attached to. And you can see that for the entered uncertainties, we calculate not, not only strike and dip, but also uh, about 1.7 degrees uncertainty on the strike and about 2.24 on the dip. This map happens to have a um, user um, measured uh, in the field strike and dip down here, and their dip is 45 degrees and the strike's quite similar, so we got close. Interestingly enough, this map has only within the area that you're looking four strikes and dips uh, at all. Most of this was done by helicopter in the 19. 60s. Um, I'm going to record that strike and dip, uh, and then I'm going to actually uh, put a point on the top of this MBF unit uh, with the click here, and uh, you can put it anywhere along here, uh, put it right there, and you can see now down here the um, program has calculated the thickness on that uh, um, uh, of the map thickness of that unit as well, 685 feet. And actually, I've recorded again. Um, and it's actually also recording the uncertainty. Uh, it calculates the uncertainty on that thickness uh, based on the uncertainty of the position vectors. So uh, that's how uh, you get those. Um, I'm actually going to uh, load in a data file now with uh, import data that I've already done for this area of um, orientations and um, also uh, contacts. Uh, even though there are only uh, four uh, measured in the field strikes and dips, we actually have calculated um, or uh, entered using three point problems in this map, uh, 37 total uh, uh, strike and dip uh, orientations, and you can see them scattered about. Now I'm gonna do another thing here, uh, which is to select uh, this contact right here to show you uh, how you can get a strike and dip from more than three points. When you select a contact, the vertices show up as boxes, and I'm going to choose lasso select inside the lasso, and then I'm just going to draw a loop around the uh, vertices that I want to include in my calculation. And you can see they're also selected in the table at the right. Then I can go to Operations, Contacts, and Best Fit Plane. We use a principal components analysis to uh, best fit a plane to the uh, selected uh, vertices. All of the vertices, of course, have individual X, Y, and Z components, so we can do this. And you can see that the strike and dip is 149 and dip of uh, 26 uh, uh, degrees. It also shows you that the standard deviation of the deviation of the point selected points from the best fit uh, selected plane. So that's one standard deviation. Uh, is 100 and the points are 130 feet from the uh, calculated or 131 feet from the calculated plane. 
You can add that to the strikes and dips if you want by clicking OK. And there it is. It's quite close to the three point ones that we did elsewhere. OK. One of the reasons for entering uh, strikes and dips is because we want to get a fold axis. So using a cylindrical fold model, we go to operations, calculate cylindrical fold axis, and it shows us the results, except that we have two different types of orientations entered, faults and bedding, and we want the bedding rather than the faults, so I'll switch it to bedding here. And you can see that the fold axis with its uncertainties uh, are displayed uh, 158 and 11 degrees. The reason why we want the fold axis is because we can now do a piercing point problem on this northeast trending fault, uh, which I call informally the Martin Lake fault since it's close to Martin Lake. So uh, let's do that. Um, we'll go to the piercing point panel uh, and we have the fold axis at the base of the CPK unit on both sides of the fault. So we can use the fold axis as the line for calculating the piercing points. First thing we do is click a point on the fault. Uh, it can be any point along the fault trace. It doesn't have to be where the fold axis intersects. And we click, oh, say here, and then we enter the strike and dip, which I previously calculated from a three point problem as 45 and 46 degrees. Uh, and it's put a new symbol there in the cyan color. Uh, then we'll click um, the first line uh, here and we'll enter the uh, um, trend and plunge of the fold axis, 158 and 11. And it's already calculated and drawn a little target symbol here and uh, has written the uh, elevation of the actual piercing point on the uh, fault plane. This, this piercing point happens to be in the air above the surface trace of the fault, but that's uh, where it is because it's projecting up plunge to uh, the fault plane. Now we can get the second line on the other side here and uh, we see the intersection, the map projection of the intersection of the piercing point on the other side. Uh, and we can see that the, uh, the magnitude of slip is uh, 227 feet or thereabouts. Finally, uh, if we'd like that, we can record it um, and um, go and, and actually see a stereo nip of the slip on the fault plane. Here's the fault plane. You can see it's an oblique slip uh, thrust fault with nearly horizontal east-west p-axis. That fits quite well with the uh, thrust structure. So it, it seems likely that this fault uh, forms at the same time as the thrust. But we have even more uh, information than that. And this is a good exercise for students to look at relative map relations because this Martin Lake fault here offsets the Sulphur Mountain thrust and the Bourgeau thrust here, but it is cut by the sawback thrust. Uh, so that we have not only a relative uh, set of uh, age relations in this area, but uh, we can also see that the sawback thrust is probably an out of sequence thrust uh, because it formed out of the normal sequence of hinterland on the, e on the west to foreland on the east uh, thrust uh, projection. All right. The final thing I want to do here is on this uh, uh, version is do a uh, plot a topographic profile. So I'll define a topo profile, click down here, uh, double click to uh, do the end of the topo profile up here. And uh, as soon as I name the, uh, the profile, um, it goes and uh, evenly samples uh, that uh, uh, for you in distance. Now, um, what I'm going to do now is actually plot the topo profile right on top of the map uh, version because that's a good way to kind of relate what you see on the profile to the, uh, to the map. So we'll do topo section on map. I'm going to project all strikes and dips within 5,000 feet uh, along the fold using the fold axis 148, uh, 158 and 11. And we're not only going to plot the, the contacts that they uh, uh, 
to profile crosses, but we're also going to plot the depth to folded surfaces on the section. And when I do that, click OK, there's my topo section. Uh, you can see uh, the greenish tick marks are the uh, apparent dips of uh, tick marks plotted on the topo section. We have the contacts plotted as little red dots on the topo section. And we have all these black dots. Uh, those black dots are actually the actual vertices of the digitized contacts projected onto the vertical plane of the cross section using the cylindrical fold axis. You might wonder what this horizontal wavy uh, line is. That's actually the program actually tried to project the Martin Lake fault, which of course really doesn't make sense. So we can go turn off the Martin Lake fault here uh, by clicking that and it removes those uh, dots. And now you can see for such things as this curve right in here, for example, is not a fold. It's simply, this is a big dip slope uh, and the actual syncline uh, is over here where the synclinal fold axis is. So in case you're interested on that Dropbox site, I put together uh, a, an exercise and uh, uh, for the Siffleur River area, uh, that one might want to to use and um, uh, this is sort of a final cross section showing the sawback thrust as a classic out of sequence uh, uh, branch line at the top of a the upper corner of a foot wall ramp and a uh, thrust belt uh, um, and so on so if you find that useful that that's great okay in the uh, uh, few minutes remaining I'm actually going to switch to another map now uh, and this one happens to be in southeastern Idaho, and this is an MB tiles map, whereas the other one was a raster one. This is a uh, southeastern Idaho classic, uh, uh, western Idaho, or excuse me, western Wyoming, eastern Idaho um, uh, thrust belt uh, stratigraphy. Uh, Twin Creek are the light colored units, Preuss red, and this ridge here is stump. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, do as I did before and set uh, do a three-point problem here uh, to on the stump, which I know is right here. It's also this ridge with uh, trees on it uh, here. So I'm going to do set a point there. And the same ridge over here is the stump. So I'm going to set a, a point over here as well. And it's calculated a... Um, strike and dip of 38 degrees, so I'll record that. So now uh, what I'd like to do is actually use that orientation and have the computer map the contact. So we'll go to operations, project contact from orientation, and calculate surface drop. In minutes, it draws the uh, uh, contact for you. And in fact, this is probably uh, way more accurate than a field geologist would do uh, because uh, it is uh, following carefully every subtle undulation in the topography uh, that uh, uh, it sees, even in areas of full tree cover, such as this area in here. To show you that that's not a fluke, I'm going to uh, do uh, another um, one. This, these sets of hogbacks are the Cretaceous Peterson limestone very typical uh, limestone in the area. So we'll set a point there, we'll set a point down here, and we'll set a point right here. Uh, we calculate uh, the strike and dip, record that, and then the uh, shortcut is command slash, uh, and it draws that contact as well. So these contacts are actually uh, more than three kilometers in length. Uh, and uh, with some exquisite uh, detail and so on. But um, the, what you should view these as are projections or hypotheses to be tested rather than uh, actual data. And to show you that, uh, here's the uh, Peterson contact, which works very well down to here. Uh, and, but uh, on the other side of this uh, tree covered uh, gully, uh, uh, the Peterson is up here. So something clearly happens through here. And what happened is that there is a uh, northeast trending normal fault, which runs through this area here and offsets the Peterson. 
So uh, this uh, sort of thing can actually help you to identify that and we can edit uh, these traces easily just by lassoing the vertices uh, and then uh, deleting the ones that um, don't uh, that don't actually match the geology. So um, just to finish up, let me just show you how these compare to the actual published map uh, of the region. Um, and uh, here is the uh, a file of the published map and um, the contact, I can change the maps and the contacts are right on them. You can see them as the cyan colors and they're not, they, the geologist map is not, not too bad, uh, but the, uh, uh, the projected contacts are, are actually uh, have a quite a bit more rich detail in them than the uh, geologist map ones as well. Uh, these, uh, this program works equally well, I should say, with some of the uh, beautiful uh, synthetic uh, maps that uh, Paul Carabinos has um, uh, produced. And it would be interesting to see whether it works with uh, uh, some of the stuff that Jackie has produced. And with that, I'll stop. And if there are any questions, happy to uh, answer them. Rick, just to start off while people are asking questions, do you have an exercise for air, an area outside the Canadian Rockies example? Uh, so another, uh, a third demo that I was going to do uh, but didn't have time to do it is actually for the Raft River Metamorphic Core Complex uh, because the, um, uh, and I do have an, uh, another set of uh, air photos, uh, NAIP, uh, uh, one meter resolution uh, satellite images for uh, the Raft Rivers and a DEM for that, uh, along with uh, MV tiles for uh, Bob Compton and Michael Wells's geologic maps of the area. So, um, so that's an area that, that can also be used. I'll also say that um, uh, we here at Cornell have a, a student who's uh, using this program with the local uh, LIDAR topography data set uh, to map uh, river terraces um, related to falling glacial lake levels um, in, uh, in the Ithaca area just to look at the different uh, uh, river terraces and so on. Uh, and we've also used uh, this on LIDAR data with uh, active fault scarps to map active fault scarps uh, and so on. Rick, this is Anne. Could you um, put that Dropbox link in the chat or else just email it to me and I can send it out to everyone? Sure. I'll Thank you. do that uh, right now. I'll leave that in my uh, uh, Dropbox um, until, uh, let's see, how long will I leave it for? I'm going to stop sharing my screen if people don't want to do that, see that anymore. So where's, there we go. And then I think we should probably quit, but I think this one question is important enough that I should just read it to you. What is the learning curve for the students in the software in your experience teaching with it? Uh, You've so, already uploaded the maps. I, yeah, so I, um, I use the, um, uh, this program uh, as uh, part of my um, uh, structure lab manual exercises. The students don't find the uh, learning curve to be ter terribly uh, steep, particularly if you give them the georeferencing files for any uh, maps that uh, you use or and or the, uh, the DEMs uh, so that they don't have to fuss around with trying to figure out how to download DEMs from Canada or the USGS or what have you. Um, the, uh, they do not discover the full uh, richness of the program unless I tell them what to do, <laughs> you know, what to, uh, to, to do. Um, but I've, I found it very successful. And in fact, um, uh, I make my students do all the calculations in a spreadsheet or in MATLAB, whatever they're comfortable with, 
uh, rather than just taking the numbers at face value. And um, uh, the program is, has, is such that with a single menu command, uh, you can copy all three or four position vectors as a matrix uh, to the clipboard and then click in a cell in Excel and just go paste and all, all nine or 12 numbers are, um, uh, appear all at once in Excel and stuff. Uh, uh, but I'm kind of uh, fussy in that way that, you know, I think students should, uh, should know how their programs work. <laughs> so I, I, I make them do that. <laughs>